Right, good afternoon everyone. Um, some of you I probably talked to a little bit earlier, but um, what I'm going to talk about today is some of the work I've been doing on addressing maths anxiety and I've been specifically working with pre-service primary teachers, but a lot of what I'm going to say uh, applies to other courses as well and I think some of um, the comments that, uh, that Don had some of what I'm going to say will follow on quite well from that. Um, so first of all, just thinking about we, you know, we ask ourselves, why is it important? Why are we, why are we talking about maths? And I think this um, quote sums it up. And we think about maths as a, as an achievement of humanity and um, the um, the sorts of things that that maths can provide us with. And I think. One of the things that always um, sticks out for me from this quote is that they say, for people to participate fully in society, they must know basic maths. Citizens who cannot reason mathematically are cut off from whole realms of human endeavour. And numeracy deprives them not only of opportunity, but also of competence in their everyday tasks. So when we talk about maths and we talk about, we often talk about or see things in the, um, in the newspapers about the number of students who are not going on to do higher level maths courses, but also we need to remember that numeracy and mathematics are really important for all the citizens in, um, in, our, in our society and that depriving citizens or having them not being able to take, um, take the opportunities that are offered them can have um, very dire consequences for them in their lives and being able to access opportunities. So what I'm going to talk about today is looking at the affective side of maths, so talking about people's beliefs and attitudes and emotions and dispositions towards maths and their identity as people who can, uh, who can do maths. And this is one of the quotes from one of my students who says, I was in year five and I failed maths and since that day I hate maths. This experience makes me feel that I don't know anything about maths. And I just wanted to share this link with you, which um, is a fairly new project that Amazon have started. Um, and it shows some students reflecting on their attitudes and the way they think about themselves and how they might change that. Yes, thanks. Just talk amongst yourselves for a moment. play it at the end if, uh, if it decides it's going to work. It, uh, it did work earlier on when we, uh, when we tested it, which, which doesn't mean, of course, that it's going to work now. But, uh, but if not, if I get a chance, I'll show it to you at the end. So when we look globally, when we think about um, what's happening in our world, we, t we uh, as I said, we talk about the rates and participation of students in in maths courses in Australia, but globally it's an issue that um, participation in higher levels of maths and in um, and higher education are significant issues for a lot of countries, looking at the rates of participation falling. And there's an, there's an international concern that um, numbers of students who are taking those courses have decreased or aren't increasing in line with the needs of the 21st century. And as well as an issue about mathematics itself, as I mentioned before with that quote, it's also a social justice issue because being mathematically literate is so important um, for people to have access to employment and to make informed decisions about their lives and about the environment and about their health. And the issue that I'm going to talk about, maths anxiety, is reported as an issue in quite a number of countries. 
um, and mathematics anxiety has not only issues for the people who are anxious about maths, but social and political and economic um, consequences for our society as well. And Golf Whitlam in 1969 said, we're all diminished when any of us are denied a proper education and the nation is the, is the loser, is the poorer. Uh, we have a poorer economy, a poorer civilization because of this human and national waste. And I won't go through these, but you will know that there have been a number of reports both from Australia and from England and from other countries as well about the concerns of the levels of maths that students are going into the, uh, into the workforce or into higher education. And this follows on from the last presentation that we were just talking about. If we look at our educational context and look at what's happening in education, um, you'll be aware that the Australian curriculum is now mandatory across all states and territories in Australia and numeracy is listed as one of the seven general capabilities for all students to develop, as well as mathematics being one of the original um, four curriculum that were developed. There's information all the time, quite often, but particularly when the results come out, about standardised testing, so the NAPLAN standardised testing, international standardised testing when the TIMS or PISA results come out, there's usually a flurry of uh, political statements and stories in the media, um, and also some of the things that are happening around initial teacher education is looking at the requirements for taking teachers into teacher education, and also you'll be aware, I think, that mandatory, num mandatory numeracy testing has been introduced. So from July this year, all students who are going to graduate as teachers will be required to pass a literacy test, but also a, uh, also a numeracy test. We have also national professional teacher standards. And in each state and territory now, we have an institute that um, supervises, I guess, um, teacher accreditation towards and using those standards for their accreditation. So there's a growing emphasis on teacher quality and intensification of accreditation requirements. At the same time, um, there are concerns raised about the high level of early career teacher attrition that we're using, we're losing so many of our early career teachers. And I think associated with this sometimes um, is the media uh, stories and the public perception of teachers. And particularly around mathematics, there are, um, there's quite a public perception that particularly primary school teachers, who are the pre-service teachers I'm working with, uh, are very poor at mathematics. And, um, but certainly the, the, as there's a lot of negativity around the public perception and the media stories about teachers. So that's the context within which I've been working with uh, my pre-service teachers. When we look at maths anxiety itself, uh, many students suffer from maths anxiety and one of the interesting things is that quite often that's independent of how good they are at maths. There's an assumption that only people that are really poor at maths get maths anxiety, but it's a bit like um, other fields of endeavour. I was, was looking at the, uh, the tennis over the, uh, over the holidays and and I have, you know, the admiration for the people that are at that absolutely crucial point and they pull out one of the best serves they've ever done in their life. And I think I'd be there, you know, um, very nervous about it. And so that idea of choking under pressure is, is something that comes up um, when students talk about their maths anxiety. They talk about um, pressure and they talk about having to do something in public in, uh, involved with maths. They don't like displaying their maths in public. And I was thinking before when, uh, when we were looking at the multiple choice questions, if we all suddenly had to do that test, how everybody would have, would have felt in the room. There's also research is showing us that maths anxiety impacts on students from the lowest levels of schools. It used to be the assumption that was something that that particularly happened around the change of, of school and going into high school. 
but more recent research is showing that, um, that students from the earliest levels um, have anxiety about maths and high levels have been reported um, in female students, although the, the research isn't clear there, but uh, the research that I have read either says there isn't a, a significant difference or that females are, uh, um, are more anxious. And so this impacts on their underrepresentation in STEM subjects. If we look at the, the theory behind uh, the investigations I've been doing, looking at the idea that, that we don't respond to, to um, objective reality, but we actually respond because of the way that we interpret a situation and we make decisions based on those emotions. And so if we perceive that something is, is harmful or threatening, we'll feel very negatively. If we feel, uh, if we perceive it uh, as something that's beneficial, beneficial, then we'll be more positive about it. And there are two ways that we look at the outcomes. Some, some students, and this re I'll refer back to students and their maths, is that it's something that we, we can't do anything about it. And so students will go into this um, fear, failure and avoidance cycle, or it's something that we can, we can do something about, we can try a different way, or we can, uh, we can do, a, uh, do a different question first and then build on the knowledge that we have. The technique that I've been using is called critical incident technique and it was developed actually um, after or, or at the end of the World War when looking at um, identifying incidents that had happened in combat and he particularly was looking at the Air Force and, and training uh, B-56 pilots. And one of the things of course that, uh, that they were concerned about when they were doing it was that the incident was reported correctly. But in the work that, that I'm doing, I'm not looking at so much what actually happened, but what the, um, what the students perceive happened and what their, what their perceptions were. So I asked students to go back to uh, an incident from their schooling that impacted on the way they felt about themselves as a learner, particularly of mathematics and also as a potential teacher of maths and really getting them to look at that incident and why they felt the way they did about it. Um, because the way that you feel about the incident is how you act on it and, and how its consequences affect you, not necessarily what happened. So coming out of that, the themes that students talked about were um, shame and humiliation, the idea of fear, failure and avoidance. So these are students that are talking about um, their maths experiences in class. Uh, they talked about the nature of maths. It was something that, uh, that was about getting the right answer and it was about knowing rules. Um, it was interesting that tests could have positive and negative impacts depending on if they did well in the test, they held that up as something that, that they kept as evidence. And sometimes those tests were in year five or year seven and they were still saying, I, you know, I feel I'm a good learner of maths because I did really well in this test in year five. Um, the parental impact and also the, the impact of the attitudes of people in society and how they, uh, how they saw them. But of course, as we all know from, from the research, the most important factor that any students talk about is the impact of the teacher. Uh, and I won't read through all those because I've had a little sign held up for me here. But they talked about the things that teachers did that made them, uh, that made them feel positive. It was about uh, feeling comfortable, about finding a way to connect the maths that they could relate to. And whereas the negative um, memories that they had were about being uh, held up in public that they couldn't do something, were about um, uh, being told not to worry about it, um, and so being, being feeling that they were a failure because they felt the teacher was giving up on them. Uh, and particularly uh, those teachers that made comments that you should know this or what are we going to do with you, particularly in public. And we all, um, know that 
that most of the teachers that we, uh, that we work with would never make some of these comments and perhaps those teachers didn't make them but this, this is the memory that that person has carried with them and that affects them. Um, so the other research I did as well as looking at the critical incident was actually surveying pre-service teachers to find out what level of um, maths anxiety they came to their, um, their course with and I found that there was quite a range of anxiety they came with and also the, um, the survey I knew identified three different areas that, that, um, that uh, caused maths anxiety and the one that was the most the one that was the most, um, that stood out the most was maths test anxiety, but there was a difference. Over different years, um, the pre-service teachers came to their courses with anxieties that presented differently. And so the distribution of these varied from year to year. And so it's not, it's something that we have to, um, to look at over time and, and be aware that, um, that students' needs will vary depending on what their particular anxiety is. Dunkel says that, talks about the, um, the cycle of mass anxiety, the fact it's becoming generational and there's evidence that it's passed on from teacher to student. And so the work that I'm doing with my students is to try and get, look at, help them address their mass anxiety and those who don't have anxiety about maths to help them understand that it might be something that impacts on their students when they go out teaching, so that it's some, there are ways that we can break that cycle and stop it um, going on to new generations. So the implications, my last slide, is that um, to break this cycle we need to recognise and understand about um, people's affective responses to maths, so it's not just about the knowledge and skills that our teachers develop or that our students develop, it's also about understanding uh, their feelings and emotions and attitudes towards maths. And I feel very strongly that uh, not only can negotiating this attitude, um, this, this issue help us with teaching and learning, but also make a difference to our society and the quality of life of, of the citizens in our society. Thank you, Sue. Okay, does anyone have any questions for Sue? Yeah, Tristram? So I've had, I mean, I'm sure we all had, uh, students who are completely debilitated by the exam anxiety, so where they're performing quite well at mathematics and then mm -hmm. for some reason they, are, they, they just completely struggle with the, the exam process. Uh, you, you were talking about this, this fighter pilot approach. There, there is, um, there are students who have test anxiety, but there are also students who specifically have mathematics test anxiety as part of their maths anxiety, but, but there is a general test anxiety and um, a number of different ways, I guess, of dealing with that are, are looking at what different ways you can assess those learning outcomes that, um, that don't cause them um, to have that level of anxiety. I guess it depends on how you I guess I was wondering if you had suggestions in terms of this, this approach to maths anxiety, so bringing that out, is it something perhaps that could be a useful there, thing to th the, ask? There is some really interesting research going on around um, sort of the pain of anticipation um, compared to actually doing it. And the first year I did, um, I did this research, I actually did, a, um, I, I did some analyses of the... Um, of the survey results and actually found out that, that there was a factor that could be identified that the maths test anxiety actually broke down into two factors, one of which was I'm really anxious about it coming up and the other about I'm anxious when I'm in the room doing it. And so I think there are different ways that we can work with that. If you're thinking about when they're actually in the room doing the maths test, then those sort of relaxation techniques and, and you know, positive self-talk techniques can help at that time because the anxiety, there's, there's the sort of fear factor and then there's the physiological response and the, um, you know, there's a number of different responses and some of those that we can actually try and, um, and control at the time. And um, leading up to the exam, I guess, uh, under talking to the student about how they feel and why they feel like that and looking for different ways that 
that you might be able to, um, we, you know, we have students who have special consideration who have um, do their exams in different rooms or do different different types of assessment tasks. So maybe looking at at how that can be done. There's, there's actually a really, um, some really interesting research that says that rather than trying to, uh, if you're really anxious, rather than trying to calm yourself down, it's easier to go across um, and still stay aroused, but aroused in a more positive way. So try and turn your anxiety in some sort of excitement. You know, those people that stand out behind the the curtains and rev themselves out up before they go out and do public speaking. So I, I don't know if there's, I just thought that was a fascinating piece of research and maybe if our students are really anxious, instead of, you know, trying to, to calm down that physiological response, there might be some way that we could turn it around and, and use it and turn it into a positive physiological response. But, um, yeah, that's it. Well, thanks very much for that, Sue. And, um